that I had met to test a model of the brain uh, in a robot, and that was a model of Hippocampus. He was working with John O'Keefe, uh, who of course now has, shares the Nobel Prize with Edvard Moser and May Britt Moser. Uh, and this, I think, was the first time anyone had tested a hippocampal model on a robot. Uh, and uh, as this was what I was interested in doing, I was, I was very interested and excited by that work. And uh, Neil is, I think, from a sort of physics maths background, but he has uh, built his career um, by merging modeling uh, with empirical work. And his empirical work has been quite broad. Uh, he's, I think, you may know some of the work he's particularly done, for instance, on uh, human navigation in virtual reality systems. Uh, he's going to, I think, focus in this talk on the modeling. Um, again, you know, I think uh, the, the, the models that, that uh, Neil has built have been uh, quite foundational in our understanding of the hippocampus, uh, and his close collaboration with neuroscientists, particularly with uh, John O'Keefe, has meant that they've always been very firmly grounded in the biology, which isn't true of all the models that, that I've seen. Um, Neil was recently elevated to the status of Fellow of the Royal Society, which uh, is the highest honor you can have as a scientist, I think, in the UK. Uh, it's not often bestowed on people that still have their own hair. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, congratulations for that. And I'm really looking forward to your talk, Neil. Thank you very much. Yes, it was only just in time, actually, in terms of the hair. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, as previous people have said, um, one brain, one question. So please ask questions. Otherwise, we'll think that Paul has all the brains, which clearly exactly. can't be correct. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about a variety of things which shouldn't take uh, the whole time. And then there's a, a variety of sort of directions in which this modeling that I'll tell you about uh, can be applied, and I might ask for your input into which direction we should discuss. So as we go through, this outline reappears, and you can think about which of these topics you would like, to, uh, you'd like me to talk about at the end. So to start with, there's a sort of introduction to spatial memory. There's a nice experiment from Wang and Simons which illustrates the multiple parallel representations that we have of where things are. This is a rather simple experiment where you see some objects on a circular table, and then um, you, you, the, the viewport is closed, and you, uh, one of the objects is moved. And then you see the array again. You have to say which one has been moved. But between, uh, when you have to ask the question, the table might have been rotated, or you might have walked the same angle around to a different viewing uh, position, or both or neither of those might have happened. And what they found was that, actually, uh, if you, you know, your performance is best if there's no change. You see the objects, one of them's moved, you see them again, you say which one's been moved. There, if you've taken a visual snapshot, if you like, of your original uh, picture here, you could use that. You might also um, know where objects are uh, relative to each other, and, and there might be other mechanisms. But Interestingly, if you go over to this other viewpoint and rotate the table by, table by the same amount, so the actual visual view is the same as at test um, compared to encoding, then when the table's rotated on its own, actually performance drops a lot. So if you have a simple visual memory model of what happens here when you do this task, then you'd be wrong. Whereas if you uh, walk around to this other viewing uh, window and the table doesn't change, uh, performance is actually still quite high. And that shows that as you move around in the world, you automatically update where you expect things to be because you know how you've moved. And so this internal updating, as they called it, you know, is clearly strongly present. And in this sort of situation, um, is, is, is uh, very helpful in terms of remembering where the object should be. Although there was one thing in this uh, experiment which I didn't like, which was that the actual rest of the lab is visible behind the table. And so you might also know where things are relative to these external visual cues. And of course, when you rotate the table, you break that association. So we did a, a follow-up experiment where it's essentially it's the same, but there's a third variable where you can rotate this uh, cue card. It's all in darkness. The objects are luminous, and the cue card is luminous. 
you can change your viewpoint, you can rotate the table, or you can rotate this cue card, which is the external cue. And um, simply to, to sort of summarize all of the results, you see a, a positive effect of consistency between encoding and retrieval of object locations compared to where they should be relative to the cue card, the external cue, or where they should be relative to uh, where you think they should be given that you know you've moved, or indeed uh, this weekly present uh, consistency with the visual snapshot you saw at encoding, that also helps your memory. So if you do an ANOVA of consistency with all these three factors, you see no interaction. They all help you, and they don't seem to interact. So it's an, it's an indication that uh, the brain has, uh, does store visual snapshots. It does know where things should be, given that uh, you've moved. It knows how, things should, uh, how the movements of things uh, perceptually should change as you move bodily in the world. And you do know where some things that should be relative to other things in the world, which we might call sort of world-referenced knowledge or allocentric knowledge. OK, so uh, first of all, I'm going to, uh, yeah. Isn't it interesting to now understand why performance is actually not equal across, across these different conditions? Because apparently in some conditions you have higher performance than in others. Yeah, sure. So, but we can manipulate all of those things. So if you take the subject, and instead of just taking them simply to a new viewpoint, you take them on a long, circuitous route, then you see no benefit. This, this factor um, where the subject moves, this drops down. So it just depends on the size of the change, uh, which you know, will be normalized differently across these different types of representation. Uh, I, can change, I can make this card uh, smaller and further away. It would then be less helpful. Okay. So for yeah. now, the take-home message is, look, these three factors all contribute, yeah. and let's assume that they all equally contribute. Uh, well, they all can contribute in their different ways. Right. And you could design the experiment to make one more important than the other if you wanted to. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so environment, so this allocentric, knowing where things are relative to, to things in the world, uh, we're going to come back to the place cells, which uh, Edvard Moser mentioned yesterday. Uh, and the hippocampus, so the hippocampus is full of these interesting cells which uh, fortunately Edvard introduced and we know something about the circuitry. And so that was what initially attracted me. We also know that it's required for memory. If there's damage there, you can't remember stuff very well. So that's what attracted me to the hippocampus as a, a thing to try and understand how the neural network there produces the behaviour, i.e. remembering where something is. So... Uh, the first sort of experiments I did when I, I went back to UCL to join John O'Keefe's lab, um, one of them was if you take a place cell that fires like this with a typical firing field near the corner of this box, and then you slide the walls of the box apart so that you change the shape and size of the environment, there are distant cues for orientation visible at all times, then you see that this unitary firing field sometimes gets pulled apart into multiple uh, firing fields, which look like the cell is getting inputs telling it how far away these different walls are in these different allocentric directions around the animal, north, west, east, and so on. And I say allocentric because, as Edvard showed you, as the rat ex explores around, this place cell fires here. It doesn't matter which way the rat's facing. So what matters is whether there's a wall to the north or the west. And perhaps if there's a wall a certain distance away from the uh, west, in the west direction or the east direction, those are both things that make the cell like to fire. And all those inputs converge at this point in this familiar square, and that's why the cell fires there. So the simplest sort of model that you could uh, use to try to predict how a place cell will fire as you change the shape and size of the environment would be something where there's some sort of uh, boundary detectors uh, which will fire according to the distance and direction of boundaries around the animal. So here would be an example. It doesn't matter which way the rat is facing, uh, but there's a cell with a sort of receptive field, uh, say an eastward 15 centimeter receptive field, and the firing rate just tells you whether there's a boundary in that receptive field or not. Okay? And if we suppose that there's a whole bunch of these cells which input to place cells, all tuned to different distances and directions, and perhaps with the more longer range tuning ones being a little bit less sharply tuned, both because the more distant barriers seem to have less influence on the firing of place cells, and because the rat will be less sure exactly how far it away it is anyway. Then you could make a very simple model of place cell firing. We have some boundary vector cells inputting to some place cell. Indeed, you could make a random selection uh, 
of uh, 10 or 15 boundary vector cells from the whole population uh, to input to each place cell. And that will explain the firing of a population of place cells quite well in terms of the shapes and sizes of place fields that you see, firing fields that you see in the population. In this example, here's two inputs tuned to the north or the east. And here are four different environments, a circle, a square, a square rotated relative to these distant orientation cues. And the distant orientation cues are tying the head direction cells to give the sort of internal compass against which these uh, cells would know whether this is east or not. Here's a larger square. So this cell would fire with a firing rate map like this, because whenever the rat happens to get near to the north wall, the cell will fire because it's a north detecting boundary vector cell. And similarly like this, similarly like this for the east detecting uh, cell. And that would predict that a place cell would fire like this in that place cell would fire like this in these four different shaped environments. These are just environments which differ in shape. If you change the color and texture and smell and so on of environments, so it's a completely different box or it's in a different room, then we will get remapping where different place cells will fire. But if you only change the um, environmental size and shape, uh, then uh, typically the same cell will fire in the different environments. Yes? So, so this means that uh, for the borders should be overrepresented? Uh, well, it does, yes, because the narrow, the short range tuning is stronger and there are more short range tuning uh, cells. So indeed, if you look at populations of place cells, you see more place fields and smaller, higher firing rate place fields nearer to the edges of the environment. That's correct. Here's an example done by Colin Lever, uh, where he recorded uh, this place cell here in these different shaped environments. Uh, I made a sort of bendy wall that you could configure into different shapes. Uh, and um, Here's a model. You could choose some boundary vector cells which, uh, which uh, fit this firing approximately. Uh, probably there's more than four, but four is enough uh, to, to make an approximate fit. Uh, and then given the model, you could predict how this cell should fire, say, if we put a barrier in the middle of the box. And indeed, because it's got these short range, powerful uh, boundary vector cells um, detecting boundaries to the south, if you put a, a barrier in the box here, then you get some firing also above the barrier. When the rat's here, there's also a boundary vector cell input uh, because it's a southbound um, detecting cell. And you can see that here, or you could use a triangular environment or whatever. And more often than not, when you record from the actual cell that you've modeled in these uh, new environmental configurations, then you get a reasonable qualitative fit to, uh, from the model to what you see over the first few trials. Now, it's also true that there is, uh, you know, this is a purely feed-forward fixed model with no learning. And that would, I don't want you to take that away as the whole story. If you continue to record from this cell, for example, for several days, then typically this weaker field will drop out. There is some learning, which you can model with a BCM-like rule, where the inputs, which are a bit stronger, if they can begin to distinguish these two in, different kind of boundaries, then you can get some learning. And the, the place cells like to end up with, with unified uh, single fields. But uh, at a first pass, a simple feed-forward model does OK. So we, this, was, um, this was a model um, which uh, we published in, in 2000, um, Tom Hartley uh, programmed. Uh, and so at this point, we just predicted that this would be some of the inputs to place cells. Uh, but then um, in, um, in 2006, we discovered some, Colin Lever again, uh, discovered some of these actual boundary detecting cells in the subiculum. So here's an example of uh, one of these cells firing in different kinds of environments shown here. So this is a, a box on a table surrounded by a curtain with a cue card. And this is uh, the curtain now removed to reveal the rest of the lab a different smell and texture and shape of box. And place cells remap here. So place cells fire a different, a different set of place cells fire in this environment than this one. But this is just a boundary detecting cell. It fires it whenever there's a boundary to the east in this case. And it doesn't matter which the environment is. And even if you remove the box from the table now, and this is just the drop at the edge of the, of the, of the table, you still get a, a boundary response to the, the west. And again, it's this cue card, which is constant, which determines what west is. Actually, east. It's always difficult looking east. And so here's another example. And you can see that it, the firing field here is duplicated when we put a barrier into the box. 
and uh, when you take it away again, uh, that extra field disappears. This is two boxes put, uh, two tables put together, and the, this is a south detecting boundary vector cell. When you pull them apart, the rat can jump across the gap, but you get firing to both of these extended environmental features, whatever they are. And uh, although Edvard uh, claims never to see any of these in enterinal cortex, you do see some which are displ displaced from the boundary a little bit. Where, so it's a boundary vector cell tuned to, tuned to a slightly longer direction. And they seem to be more, they're, they're less common than the short range ones in the subiculum, but there are uh, several examples in subiculum. In enteri medial enterinal cortex, there are some examples, although it's a, it seems like they're quite rare. Here's, no, it's, a, it's, it's, as you can see, say, from the curvature here, it's, it's responding to the boundary at, at a vector, a northward vector, right? Uh, I can prove that, for example, here. This is one that fires at some distance from the south boundary, and I put a barrier in halfway, and it fires at some distance above that boundary. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you accept that proof. Uh, and it's in, we could talk about these for a lot. Uh, Colin uh, Lever did record from some and switch the lights off, and they continue to fire. But they were short-range ones, so maybe some tactile input. So they're polymodal; they don't depend on vision. But how these longer-range, uh, longer-range boundary vector cells detect that distance is interesting. And he didn't have one of them when he turned the lights off. I think he's working on that at the moment. So as Edvard also mentioned, uh, Jim Neerim in uh, Hippocampus. Okay. Okay. So the, here you would say, in principle, what I need is, is a vector, uh, an, LS, an LS vector, and I need some modality that helps me detect the boundary, and I just merge the two together. Would you agree with that? Is, uh, is that the, the fundamental yeah. two elements you would need? Yeah. Okay, so then in this case, where does the allocentric vector come from? Well, it requires the head direction cells, so that's why I pointed out this um, Q card. If you rotate this Q card, the tuning of the head direction cells rotates with it, and, the, and the, all of the uh, locations of place fields will rotate as well. So these head direction cells are giving you the, the, the overall direction of the grid fields, the border or boundary cells, the place, the place cells. That's the compass. What okay. makes uh, head direction cells? Head direction cells is uh, with respect to the position of the animal. No, what I mean is uh, a given head direction cell will fire whenever the animal is facing, say, north. But what north means is determined by the uh, cues uh, in the arena. And the distant visual cues are the most strong uh, contributor. Also, other cues contribute to this sense of direction. But if you have a single distant visual cue, like this big card, and you rotate it, then the tuning will rotate. So now this head direction cell will, will yes. The allocentric direction of tuning of the head direction cells are controlled by the environment, and the single most important cues are distant visual cues if they're present. The shape of the box, odors, sounds will also contribute, uh, but the distant visual cues are the strongest. So yes, yeah, so uh, we now see also uh, in a, a small number of cells in hippocampus, reported by Jim Neerim's group, uh, object vector cells. And it seems that, uh, as we saw from the talk, you see some uh, immediate enterinal cortex. Maybe uh, they're more prevalent there than in CA1, where Neerim was looking. And uh, the Moser group also published in lateral enterinal cortex these object trace cells, where these are interesting cells that might have a, a spatial location of firing uh, anyway in an empty environment, although this might be a bit unreliable. But when they introduced an object, initially uh, there's some firing around the object. But then when the object is taken away or moved to a different place, there's firing in the location that it used to occupy. And that happens again when you now move it again. And uh, you can end up with a, a cell which fires for lots of uh, the previous locations of objects which are no longer present. So they're the trace cells. They called them object trace cells, um, which we'll come back to in a second. So um, there's lots of, we know a lot about these neurons in, in rats. And so if we're interested in humans, which most of us are, and human spatial memory particularly, we should be able to try and put together a, a neural network model which um, you know, has these sorts of representations and shows how they can uh, produce memory. In, including your, your object cells and boundary cells? Yes. Whole yes. Uh, so um, just going back to this egocentric, allocentric distinction that I, that I um, raised before, if you think about, say, a uh, place cell, uh, 
here, this place cell, the, the rat in red bold here, the place cell fires when it's over here. And it's probably because there's a certain configuration of distances and allocentric directions to boundaries, south and east here. So if I uh, now have the rat in the opposite direction, the same part of the world, the place cell will fire there. Whereas if it's over here, where egocentrically the view might look very similar, there's a boundary ahead and to the right, the place cell doesn't fire. And this is why we term this an allocentric response or world-centered. It's the place in the world that counts. But uh, the egocentric equivalent would be a cell like this, more like a sensory cell, and there are many of these in the brain, where the scene here, there's an object, there's a boundary ahead and one to the right. Now, if I turn around, the scene is different and my cell won't fire. But if it's an egocentric cell, it would fire when the rat's over here, because now the sensory input is similar. This would be, we call an egocentric response. The same is true for head direction cells, but I won't come back to that unless we want to go there. So uh, there's an issue because actually all of uh, sensory perception is egocentric. When I, when I rotate the, the directions of all the stimuli coming onto my sensory uh, detecting apparatus uh, changes. And uh, also action is egocentric. If I want to move my legs and go somewhere, you know, obviously left and right is important. I need to turn left and go that way. So I might have these things that know about north and south and east and west, you know, the head direction cells and these other spatial representations, but I'm always going to need input which is egocentric and output which is egocentric. And indeed, we'll come on to imagery. When you imagine a scene, typically it's kind of head-centered. You imagine what was in front of you and what was left and right of you, and you can imagine a scene, and actually if you rotate, then usually the, the scene rotates with you. I mean, if you try hard, you could imagine rotating. But I mean, usually imagery is also a bit like perception, and it's also egocentric. And uh, so a nice a neuropsychological experiment showed uh, the importance of, of this kind of um, distinction. So with the, the famous um, hemispatial neglect patients. So uh, hands up if you haven't heard of hemispatial neglect. OK. I should always say, hands up if you have heard of something, because yes. then it's not an expression of, yes. yes. OK, well, anyway, some people are brave enough to, uh, if you're not a neuropsychologist, there's no reason why you should. So if you have uh, damage to the uh, right side of your brain, typically uh, in parietal and also uh, frontal areas, then often you ignore things on the left. And often this is a perceptual thing, and you don't eat the food on the left-hand side of the plate and this kind of thing. But some patients have imaginal neglect or representational neglect, where even when they try and imagine a scene, they don't pay attention to the left-hand side of it. And this was first shown by Biziak and Luzzati. And they had um, Italians who had grown up in Milan and were very familiar with the uh, Piazza del Duomo in the center of, of, of Milan. And these patients were asked to imagine being in the Piazza del Duomo, uh, facing uh, away from the cathedral, and to describe the scene that they imagined. And they described all these buildings here with red dots on. And then when they were asked to imagine uh, being there facing the cathedral and to describe the scene, they described all these uh, buildings on the right here with green dots on. And so what that shows is that they did have a full memory of the whole layout of the scene and all of the buildings around uh, the central square. But when they were trying to imagine it from a particular viewpoint, they were ignoring one side or the other side, depending on the viewpoint. So they had an egocentric deficit of the left-hand side, but their allocentric knowledge of the layout of the square was intact. And this is probably because of the parietal damage that they had on the right side of the brain. But we think in the hippocampus, there would have been an allocentric representation of where everything was, which was intact. OK, so we'll come on to that. Uh, if we wanted to... Um, think about a population coding of boundary vector cells for environmental layout. Then if we've got an agent here facing this way, and here's the boundary around it, then if we look down on a topographically organized layer of these boundary vector cells, and so up here is north, and each of these dots represents a cell which is tuned to, say, a short distance to the north, or a long distance to the north, or a short distance to the south, and so on. If we look down on the activity of that population of cells, we'd see some activity that sort of replicated the layout of these boundaries around the animal with north up. And that would be the boundary vector cells that I've just described. Whereas if we had an egocentric representation, like in parietal cortex uh, or in some sensory area, then now um, a head is, is up. These are egocentric. I'm facing this way. My, say, visual input or other inputs. Um, a head is going to be up. And a, a population of these cells would now have an activity pattern which was somewhat rotated because a head is up. And as I rotate around, it's what's in front of me which is encoded by these cells up here, 
what's behind me that's encoded by these cells down here. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, but actually, in the model that we want to make, we need to translate between these two kinds of representation because we want to go from perception to memory and then from memory to action or imagery. And so we need to translate, in this case, with respect to head direction. And so uh, let me just... So some work uh, by uh, Alex Pouget has looked at... Um, so who's aware of Alex Pouget's work on uh, coordinate transforms? No, OK. So you can set up um, a nice attractor system where you have um, neurons uh, representing things, say, egocentrically, and neurons represent, representing things allocentrically. So in the case of head direction cells, because that's one dimension, it's a little bit more simple to think about. Here's a head direction cell, and it represents uh, north. When the animal's facing north, it fires. And you know, we might have an egocentric representation uh, where, where these cells represent left, ahead, or right, because that's an egocentric representation. And we know our head direction. Uh, so we know our head direction. And here's the corresponding allocentric representation of this egocentric representation. Now, these boundary, could be boundary vector cells, represent things north, east, south, or west. And so if I'm uh, facing north, then things to my east are also to my right. Okay, and you make a circle information for you. I don't know why this is cutting out a little bit. Um, simply by making a tractor network with an expanded representation. So each of these neurons has a tuning curve which is allocentric and a tuning curve which is egocentric, and their firing is the product of the two. And so you can look, think of it as a lookup table that allows you to translate these into these, given the, you know your head direction. You could have a whole. They, it's a very nice system. I recommend reading Alex Pouget's papers about it. You can wire it all up with Hebbian learning, and it will be an attractor system that will settle. If you give it, say, these two inputs, it will automatically give you this one. Or if you give it these two, it will give you this one, and so on. It's a very nice uh, system. So we're going to uh, use that kind of system to uh, rotate between um, allocentric uh, representations and egocentric representation. So we might have some boundary vector cells uh, representing the layout of the environment around us. And we've got one of these expanded representations, which is um, which one of these uh, expanded representations is selected by a head direction cell, which tells us which way we're facing and does the appropriate trans translation into the egocentric coordinates. Or as I said, and that, that would be how you retrieve long-term allocentric memory into uh, imagery or action. Or indeed, during encoding, you've got perception, which is egocentric. And again, because you know your head direction, uh, you can use the right one of these expanded representations to, to map you onto the allocentric representation and make the right boundary vector cells fire, given your sensory input. So we're going to use these translation uh, circuits which we believe are in parietal cortex and possibly uh, retrospinal cortex, which I'll show you in a, a second. And we're going to try and make a model which includes all of the things that we just talked about. And so uh, in CA3, we've got place cells, and they have strong recurrent connections to each other. So the famous Hockfield model or Mars model of the hippocampus uh, does uh, allocentric, uh, sorry, does associative recall by uh, pattern completion in an attractor network here with these strong recurrent connections. But we've also got, as we heard uh, in the talk this morning, in perirhinal cortex, we've got neurons which identify specific objects, for example. And here, we think probably in more parahippocampal, uh, also, well, subiculum and medial entorhinal cortex, we've got boundary vector cells and object vector cells. And these all project to each other. And so we basically have a big attractor network here, where if I tell you which place, if I activate the right place cell, then you can reactivate the um, boundary vector cells and object vector cells uh, and their identity cells to indicate what was the uh, stored pattern of activity for a particular location in a particular environment. Uh, I'll come on to a simulation in a minute to, to make that clearer. But having done this in our long-term memory in and around the hippocampus, we need to, uh, for retrieval, we need to go through one of these uh, translation circuits to generate an egocentric image to imagine, you know, you were having lunch yesterday. Uh, imagine the scene. Uh, where was your friend? You know, was he sitting on your left when you were sitting at the table and so on? And then you can imagine the scene. And this is egocentric. You have to imagine what's ahead of you, left and right of you. And during encoding, uh, you can use the translation circuit in the opposite direction to make the appropriate cells fire 
and do some heavy and learning to wire up this associative network. So, so yes. Now we have a, a bunch of functional labels yes. for different transformations, and at the right it says CA3. Yes. So how are you mapping this now on the hippocampal circuit? Are you going to talk about it later? Uh, well, uh, very, very crudely is the answer. So where it says CA3 because in our model there are recurrent connections which are in CA3. But this is just a bunch of place cells. And in fact, they sort of stand for all of the complexity of, of uh, CA3 and CA1 and dentate. And we ignore all of that. We're trying, because we're trying to actually understand higher cognitive function, we're making the simplest possible model at this point. So it has some place cells. And they have some recurrent connectivity, so I've called them CA3. But right. there's, no, there's no ion channels, there's no complexity, there's no dendrite. They're just uh, simple, they're going to be simple firing rate neurons. All of these neurons are simple firing rate neurons. All of the connections are simple heavy and learned uh, connections. I've put these labels on. I think that's where they are in the brain. That's as far as it goes. There's no anatomy or anything. Oh, well, these, these connections are present, so it's, you know, there we are. These head direction cells, we think they do form an attract, a ring attractor circuit, which is how we model them. But it's not really important. And uh, as we'll see, we know, so we, we're, we're sort of putting the functional bits of the model onto the brain. Doesn't really affect how the model works. OK, so here's a simulation. So um, now here's a, uh, a ring of head direction cells and some activity indicating that the agent, which is here, is facing south. OK, here's some place cells. This is a topographically arranged sheet of cells. There's a bump of activity indicating that the agent is in this location in its environment. It's facing in south, and so um, here's the sort of egocentric view is, is rotated because up is ahead. So this blue bit is the section of boundary which is sort of visible. If it was a bit of a humanoid agent, uh, rats can see behind them, so that's a bit confusing. If this was a Alice, these are boundary vector cells or object vector cells, they fire according to, as I showed you, a topographically arranged set of these cells would have a sort of activity pattern indicating the presence of these walls here around the agent, uh, driven in this case by sensory input, which would look like this because the head is up. So the sensory input is telling the animal that there's a, there's a boundary to the right at a short distance, one ahead and then a one quite far away to the left. And that information is feeding through the translation circuit to the allocentric representation and making it fire like this. And, and these inputs from boundary vector cells are making the place cells fire here. Head direction cells uh, are just automatically know the head direction. We haven't uh, modeled that in detail, but there's uh, a lot of is, is known about how they, how they work. And here in uh, perirhinal cortex, we've got um, something that's going to identify an object. This is an object, and it's got a particular characteristics, which will be encoded there. And also the different characteristics of the different boundaries um, around the animal are encoded there, too. So we can, and this is Andrei Bikansky um, most recently, but I should point out that um, the basis of this model was um, we published in, in NIPS and in a um, philosophical transactions paper with Sue Becker, who did the original coding. And now, uh, more recently, Andre has added these things like object vector cells. So if we start running, you can see here's the uh, place cells tracking the movement of the animal. Now it's rotating. You can see the head direction cells tracking the rotation. This is all being driven by sensory input. And now you see there's some sensory input from the object it's in encountering. And this is a familiar environment and a new object. So now it's learning new heavy and learning connections between the location of the object, the object vector cells, and the boundary vector cells and place cells, so that now its map, if you like, of, the, of this room includes the presence of that object in it, which it encoded uh, when it first met it. So I've slowed that down so I could explain that. And you saw the object identity neuron was firing then too. So the, the animal carries on its way, and now maybe it's reminded to do recall. Where did I leave my keys? Maybe its partner asked it. And so uh, by driving up this uh, object identity neuron, it can force the attractor back to the situation where it encoded the encounter with the object and make the firing of the boundary vector cells and place cells and head direction cells correspond to that encounter. And if it wanted to then, having reactivated the place cells, it could generate a vector back to go there. Or in this case, it just carries on its way. OK, so uh, who understood that? That simulation, asking it the positive way. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I'll uh, 
go through it again. So this is all sort of sensory feed forward thing going through this mapping to make the boundary vector cells and place cells fire. Also the sensory input makes the head direction cells fire. We're not simulating that. Here's a new uh, object and so that has to be encoded. So the associations in that attractor network between the object vector cells, the object identity cell, and all of these other cells which are active need to be heavy and learned to include it now into the representation of this environment. Having done that, that um, associative learning, now when the animal heads off, if it wants to recall that object, for example prefrontal cortex or some input drives up the representation of that object identity, that can force the activity of all these cells it's connected to back to the pattern at encoding which is shown here, and there's the object vector cells, and there's the boundary vector cells, and this is the location and the direction when it encountered the object. And that's how you bring to mind the event of having bumped into this new object. And so it's a neural level simulation, or trying to get to a neural level simulation of, of what happens when, you know, I say, you remember you having lunch yesterday in this place, who was there, can you recreate the scene around you? And it did recreate the scene around you, but actually because it's memory now, it's our century. It also included information about stuff behind you, which you couldn't actually see. And when you're doing, when you recreate, so the, the memory uh, reinstantiates the pattern, say, here in the boundary vector cells and the object vector cells, and it's the whole pattern, including what's behind the, uh, the animal. Then to view that, or actually imagine it uh, in conscious awareness or episodic memory, um, Tulving is very clear about episodic memory being what you can consciously re-experience, which I think means imagine, uh, whereas the declarative memory is a little bit harder to, to interpret. And so here, because you've recreated this stuff, you still can't imagine until you go back through the translation circuit and implement an egocentric view of it in your parietal areas. And in that representation, you can only visualize the bits in front of you, because uh, that's the egocentric representation. You probably don't have neurons for representing visually what's behind you. Yeah. So if someone asks you about uh, that object in that scene, uh, you, could, you could easily answer the question without, uh, without sort of uh, imagining that you're turning egocentrically because you have an allocentric representation. Well, that's a very interesting question. And um, when you get to what can you say in verbal responses about memory questions, it gets very complicated, as we heard with uh, consciousness and so on. So um, how much of this allocentric representation in the medial temporal lobe is available to conscious awareness is your question. And what I've simulated is the bit of it which projects into the parietal lobe and gives you imagery. That is your visual spatial sketch pad or whatever that, that psychologists would call it. That is explicit. You're aware of that imagined scene, and you can answer questions about it. Now, there's other stuff behind you which you know about, and probably you can output via semantic or, or linguistic mechanisms, which I have not simulated. Sure, maybe you can access this and output in other ways, but I've only simulated this way of outputting it, which involves visualizing it. So yes, I, I think you're right, but I haven't, I haven't simulated you um, saying, oh, yes, I do happen to know there's some objects behind me, because I don't know what the neurons are doing to allow you to do that. Because language is far too complicated to try and model at this level where we actually know what the neur neurons are doing. Yeah? Um, in your trajectory, like the ADN follows, you have three kinds of trajectory, right? I have, oh, in this simulation, yeah, yeah, we've yeah. made it do something. Would work exactly the same way if you uh, plan a random walker trajectory? Yes. But, but, but an interesting point is that, so the question was, um, would it work if you had a random trajectory of exploration? And, and yes, but actually, um, I've pre-learned, I said this is a familiar room, and I've pre-learned all of the connections between all of the place cells that fire in that uh, room and all the boundary vector cells and object vector cells, although there, there weren't any objects during learning. And so that's all pre-learned. But yes, you can run the simulation so that it learns all of those associations while it explores but it's a more complicated simulation to do. And the, and the input that the agent receives, uh, that, that, that bit that is fed into the model, what, what happens? The inputs, um, the inputs come in, in here, basically, they, the sensory, we don't 
represent, we don't actually simulate visual cortex or anything. It, it gets to know what the distances and directions are egocentrically to these boundaries or objects, which makes these egocentric boundary cells or egocentric object cells fire by magic. But we could, if you wanted, you could simulate visual cortex. It wouldn't add anything at this point. So a question that I'd like to, to ask is, isn't that overcomplicating the, the whole thing? Because, I mean, if you want to like, decode your location and decode the vector to reach a target, wouldn't the population of place cells and head direction cells be sufficient to do so, like, even without having all those parietal boundary vector cells? Yes, or, yes. Or? No, no, that's a very good point. So this is a trying to... What I'm trying to get towards is a model of human episodic memory, where you reimagine the scene of the thing that happened. Sure, just to navigate, um, you might have outputs from place cells or indeed grid cells we come onto, which will tell you what, what, which way to go. Yeah. Yes, and that might be unconscious. And even if, it, 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 well, in, in, in situations where you've made a route many times, it seems like the striatum is actually telling you where to go, probably in terms more of uh, turn left here, turn right here. And you, you often are not very consciously aware of that. Uh, if, if there's a roadblock and you think, oh, your road's blocked, then you might have to do some conscious path planning where you imagine going this route and maybe then you can go this route. Uh, and that would be more this um, explicit system where you're actually imagining what will happen. Um, whether, again, it's the same question really, whether this stuff here, the place cells, head direction cells, uh, grid cells when we come onto it, boundary vector cells, whether these allocentric representations are available to consciousness or whether they're explicitly available or not, it, it, it's not so clear. We, we don't know. You might just get a sense of direction that that's the way you want to go. It might not be consciously accessible. But, yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, the activity of the cells here are modulated by attention. And we, we included that even in the first version of this model. So when you have a visual scene, you can say, yeah, I'm really interested in what was uh, to the left under the table when I was having lunch. And you could focus attention at a particular part of this topographically arranged egocentric uh, population. stuff to do with the semantics, which is, would be in the medial temporal lobe, like the identity of the object. And that knowledge is stored in the medial temporal lobe, and we're proposing that the uh, conscious access to it is via this explicit part, the visuospatial sketch pad that you can actually imagine. You can drive up activity there, and it will retrieve the relevant activity in this big medial temporal lobe memory storage thing, which only certain aspects of the information are consciously accessible when, when you pull them out. And really, you can see this whole system as a way of um, retrieving from all of your long-term knowledge just those the right subset of that enormous potential combinations of all the kinds of information, the, the right subset which is consistent with having a single viewing location and a single viewing direction. You know, I know a lot of things about the layout of the Milan Square for example, if I grew up in Milan. Uh, but it, it's all, all the way there in the medial temporal lobe, but it's not accessible to consciousness. What I can do is say, suppose I'm in this location facing this way, reactivate all of that subset of information consistent with that view and make me an image. And that's how I can do the, the retrieval. So, so we learned more about this whole mapping. OK, I understand that. But now, in the driver cortex, that's where the magic happens. Because that's where I'm going to imagine now egocentric positions in which I can recall allocentric relations. Right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, you might say that's where the attention happens. I don't know which is magic, but yeah. No. But the question is can you interpolate? Can I imagine and accurately infer allocentric direction from egocentric positions I've never visited? 
this ice danger model can only do that for positions that are actually visited because it's in a subject network and it cannot reliably sustain or support interpolation. That's my claim. That's, yes, so um, I will come on to that. And I think grid cells are uh, required to do no, at, at least long-range interpolation. At this stage, that's correct, right? At yes, at this stage, this simulation is just... Um, Yes, simulating. It, it, it's, it it's builds a lookup table of all egocentric positions visited. It can look up allocentric yes, relations. Yes, yes. What, what, what I wanted to say is that the aim of this model is to explain uh, the role that the medial temporal lobe has in this parietal function you're talking about. Now, in the parietal lobe, there's lots of other things happening. This is to do with... It, it, it's only required when there's long-term memory. Uh, and so when you need to retrieve something about a scene that you've experienced. There's all kinds of other manipulations you could do, and we'll come on to some of them. You could, for example, imagine you could drive your uh, play cells with uh, what we think the top-down uh, frontal signal would be mock motor efferents, saying, suppose I went north now, what would the scene look like? But unless you'd actually been there, you wouldn't be able to retrieve that scene, that's because that's, that's this is the memory component. Now, your parietal lobe might, because you're used to walking and you know how optic flow works, might be able to interpolate a little bit and say, well, I know what it looks like now. If I go over there, it'll look like this. But that wouldn't require long-term memory, and that's not what this model is modeling. Sure, but what I'm saying is maybe also not modeling the imagery as, um, for instance, tested on these many web stations, right? because they were asked to imagine positions that might never have visited. Oh, OK. Well, actually, in this case, it's a well-chosen example, because they grew up there. They had, ex you know. To, w when they're asked to imagine face, but, uh, but I take your point. Mm -hmm. uh, although I would say because the uh, place cell tuning curves are quite, they're broad, and as you go more ventrally, they get broader and broader, then that gives you some interpolation anyway, mm -hmm. in the sense that. Um, but you didn't test that? No. Yeah. Right. Uh, right, and so you can use this sort of model to try and uh, understand what happens, say, in the scanner or behaviorally. So here's uh, somebody in the scanner where uh, we asked them to remember the location of an object. And uh, you see, compared to um, some control conditions, you see increased uh, metabolic activity in hippocampus and parahippocampus typically, and we think this would be the sort of scene representation. And then running all the way up through retrospinal cortex into the medial parietal area. And we think, uh, and you also see posterior parietal, like area 7A, where, which is where you see uh, gain field neurons, which are these conjunctive neurons that might fire according to the retinotopic position of a stimulus, modulated even by the orientation of the body of the monkey. These conjunctive signals, uh, conjunctive cells are what you need for this translation circuit. So we might think that they were here, but we also think that they, they, they should be in retrospinal cortex, where you also see some of these conjunctive cells, although it's been much less studied there. Uh, so it helps you to uh, interpret these blobs, if you like, because at least there's functions now for these neurons' activities. Uh, but you can also make behavioral predictions. So actually, uh, as you said, without needing the, uh, the imagery and so on, a simplest possible uh, model of, of memory for location would be if I uh, need to remember this location, say I stand here where this flag is, and I need to go back there, maybe I just store the pattern of activity, also the pattern of, uh, driven by the boundary vector cells around me, uh, of, of my play cells. And then when I want to go back there, I just move around so as to maximize the overlap between the current firing of my play cells and that stored pattern of play cell firing. That would be the simplest model. And like you say, you don't actually have to imagine a scene. Uh, so uh, we did uh, an experiment like that. This was uh, Tom Hartley again. I'll show you a video to um, show you how this experiment went. So you have a, a rectangular environment, some distant cues for orientation. You have to remember the location of this flag. When you're happy, you know where it is, you press a button, uh, and then there's a short pause, then you go back into the environment, which may have changed in shape and size, so you'll probably notice this has been made quite a bit bigger along one axis. Uh, you will know, the subjects notice this, they're just told to do their best to return to the same location and put a marker down there. And if you do that many times, you get um, a lot of data. And um, the data... Uh, are the dots here, for example, this is where the flag was and this is the environment they were tested in. The dots here show where people made their responses. And the uh, shaded thing is where the place cell overlap, that's the place cell overlap model, the overlap is maximal here where it's red and minimal where it's blue. Uh, 
And it predicts the pattern of data better than other models we could think of, uh, such as remembering the distances to the walls or the angles to the corners or other things that we could think of. So if you do a, it's the maximum likelihood model with the same number of parameters that we could find using the boundary vector cell input to identify, to specify the place cell firing and storing the place cell firing. And that was Well, in this environment, the, the orientation cues are infinitely far away. There is only a boundary. And so, in this environment, yes, you couldn't do better, I would say. Uh, let, me, let me show you the, the data a bit more. I can show you more data if I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's some interesting. Uh, th there are some interesting um, aspects of the raw data. So here's 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 more data. We, we did a few experiments like this. So e each one, this is where the flag was, and this is the uh, density of responses across a bunch of uh, undergraduates. And you, so you get some data like this. And uh, you can. This is the the model where again we have uh, we have four boundary vector cells. It's the it's the simple model of boundary vector cells to place cells. Uh, and you um, go to the location that maximizes the overlap. And so when the environment hasn't changed, it works fine, as you'd expect. Uh, and then there's no real right answer when, when you've changed the environment. They're usually aware the environment has changed, and they're just they're quite happy to guess. Uh, and so that, but if you, if you look, um, it, we couldn't find a model that did better. But it's a very restricted environment in which the queues are designed to, to fit this kind of model. Oh, you could do much better, but you wouldn't fit the human data better. So the human data also the point is the human data also tends to stretch out parallel to the boundaries to some extent. Uh, we don't capture it perfectly, but we couldn't think of a model that captured it better. But here's, here's um, so I'm really going to punish you with data now. So here's one, uh, one trial, right? And this is where the flag was, and this is where the average response was of these participants. But you can break that down into individual participants. Here's um, each symbol is a different participant. And so what you can see is that actually most of them do a pretty good job. Um, but some of them are, are confused. And, and these ones down here seem like they're uh, matching this distance to the southern boundary. Most of them are matching the distance to the slightly closer northern boundary. They're all paying a lot of attention to this east wall because that's the closest. Except for, you know, it's real data. Here's somebody. Who knows what they were doing? Well, I'll tell you. Th so the point is here, what's interesting, and going back to the question about the imagery, is uh, here's the encoding. This is the... Um, orientation they had at encoding when they pressed the button to say they were happy they knew where the flag was and uh, now test my memory and you can see there's a lot of orientation matching you, even these <laughs> so so they are um, trying to match their orientation at retrieval compared to encoding so they are probably trying to match the visual scene as well and so there are all these different kinds of frameworks and I've only uh, simulated the uh, allocentric one so these Visual snapshots, they're also trying to match those. I haven't simulated that. That's also adding what would be noise in the comparison with our, data, with our model, but it's all in the data. Uh, but interestingly, even, let me find a good example. Uh, yeah, so these ones here, they're matching the orientation they had facing north, but they're actually responding, uh, maintaining the distance to the southern wall, which is behind them. So there are multiple frames of reference and there are multiple parts of the brain trying to help you solve this task and I've only simulated one of them. Well, because remember my comment about the number of brains you must have. <laughs> <laughs> no, because um, your model is capturing the average across the whole group but you see that not a single individual shows this elongation of the response that your model is predicting. Uh, no, no, that's not true. No, they are they, because they're paying attention to this east wall. You see, they are uh, actually within subject a little bit uh, elongated, uh, parallel to that wall. But no, but you're right. And my point here is, there's a whole brain there, and there's lots of other bits of it doing other stuff. Like visual matching is the most obvious, but other other strategies as well. And we're not modelling those at all. And 
And probably, uh, from other experiments we've done, the, the uh, individual differences you see most strongly are the, um, the weights with which you combine these different mechanisms. So, for example, if you have this striatal system that sort of remembers turns and so on, uh, versus this hippocampal system, which is more uh, allocentric, different people we weight those in different ways. So you can uh, design an experiment where people will go left if they're using the place in the room and go right if they're remembering the body turn by putting them in from the other way, uh, essentially. Then you see individual differences um, you know, in what the weighting is. And so some people will weight vision more, some will weight this allocentric uh, system more. And, and, and so there is a route into indi individual differences there. And, and um, they also occur, so there are, you see sex differences. I'm sure you're interested in sex differences. Um, interestingly, for this uh, round table experiment, for uh, just spotting where the, which object has moved, uh, women are better than men. And so they are probably u waiting a, a, a strategy where they're uh, remembering the array and where objects are relative to each other. But when you have to change a viewpoint location, uh, men are a bit better than women because maybe they're a bit better at, at, at calculating where things should be given their own movements. And so, yes, there's individual differences, but I, I think it's probably more in how these different systems are weighted than in, in the, how the systems work themselves. Um, right. Okay, so we were here. Uh, yeah, so grid cells. We, we can't ignore grid cells. Although most of this modeling was done before grid cells were discovered, so obviously we did ignore grid cells. So we heard about grid cells. Uh, for reasons which we could discuss, they're associated with path integration. I think it's because neighboring grid cells have very similar grid-like firing patterns which are offset constantly from each other. So if one grid cell fires here, the neighboring grid cell fires here, somewhere else they fire with that same uh, offset. And so you can think of a population of grid cells as being a good uh, basis on which to update your representation of where you are by how you move because every time I move to the east, I just have to shift from this grid cell to this grid cell. And that will be true in a different environment, because there's no remapping between environments. And it'll be true in different places. Um, and there's more complicated arguments like that that you can make. So first of all, um, you know, we've, uh, I've talked about sensory environmental inputs and now self-motion. We know where we are because we know how we moved recently. We know we were over there, and I've now I've moved a little bit. Uh, so I know where I am, both because I can now see the new distances and directions to the boundaries, but I also know where I was and I know roughly how I've moved. And so we think, I think the grid cells are, are doing that spatial updating uh, by movement, and we think boundary vector cells and other sensory inputs are telling place cells where to fire on that basis. And so it would be interesting to know, you know, we've got a sort of hypothesis that place cells are sitting there taking all these inputs and making the best estimate. Where am I on the basis of sensory input? And on the basis of how I've moved recently. You could think of a Kalman filter. You know, you're, you're weighting your sensory input, but you also know your previous states, and you know you can't have moved too far. And so maybe play cells are combining self-movement with uh, sensory input to try and make the best running estimate of where you are. But you could actually record some play cells in a situation where you can dissociate these two kinds of inputs. So this is an experiment uh, which Guifen Chen, shown in the bottom there, uh, did. Uh, in a virtual reality for mice that we set up a while ago. And what you can see is the mouse runs in this virtual linear track. Uh, we made various manipulations. So one, um, we had the mouse just sitting there and moved the visual world passively. Or we changed the gain between the visual motion uh, it experiences and the actual motion on this ball that it's using that drives the visual projection. And some cells, uh, about a quarter of them, seem to be sort of pretty sufficient being driven by vision. So even when they're not moving at all or when you've changed the game, they still fire in the same place on the track. But most cells uh, show a response where they need to be running to fire, actually. And if you change this gain, the, 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 how far they physically run affects where the cell fires along the track. So that most uh, require motor as well as uh, visual input. Well, I wouldn't say conjunctive. No, I think that it's more that they are com trying to combine these different kinds of cues, and, and they need both 
kind of fuse to be present to fire. They're, they're not that happy to go with just one on its own. <coughs> Having said that, if you turn the lights off in a normal situation, the place cells will continue to fire, so they don't need vision. But if you remove all uh, sensory input, which is difficult, uh, then the, the, the firing fields will presumably accumulate error because path integration will accumulate error. This is CA1. We would expect it to be the same in CA3. But uh, for half of the cells, almost, um, if you give them vision at the start of the track and then as they run the visual projection is switched off, then um, the cells will still fire in the right place based on the path integration. So for simple short linear distances, if you've had a visual fix at the start, uh, your place cell will still fire in the right place. Obviously for longer paths you would accumulate a lot of error. But half of them uh, don't fire in the right place or fire non-spatially or stop firing. And so again we see mo most, at least half the cells do need both inputs. Half of them can do with just the motor input if they've had a visual fix and a quarter of them can, can deal with just the... Well this, this firing here is just, it's, it's crapped out. It's not really firing, in a, it's firing, for a, it's not really a single peak that's drifting across trials. It's just not firing very reliably on any trial. Okay, and so if you look at um, grid cells, grid cells are supposed to be doing this path integration, but in fact, the place cells project to the grid cells just like the grid cells project to the place cells. And so um, we were interested, and this is Caswell Barry, who did this uh, with Kate Jeffrey. Uh, we were interested in doing this same uh, stretchy box experiment with grid cells because. Uh, if they're supposed to be path integration, they, should, they shouldn't care about these uh, sensory inputs from the walls. But in fact, they do. Um, they show a, when you have a familiar box here in red, and then you do trials where you squash the box, the pattern of grid fields squashes. So not one-to-one, -one, it squashes by about 50% of the reduction in the environment. And if you expand one, you see similarly about a 50% expansion. If you keep doing this experiment for, for a long time, the cells get tired of stretching and squashing and um, start to ignore the size of the environment if you, uh, if you do, if you do uh, uh, these, these um, four or five trials a day for um, say a week or so you start to see this effect reducing. Okay, so we're sort of getting a cartoon-like picture of uh, you know, environmental input and path integration and say boundary vector cells from the environment, also object vector cells if there are objects, uh, might be making a place cell fire in a particular location within its environment. That would be here. And then there's grid cells which we think are principally <coughs> driven by self motion with, with their grid like firing pattern, but they must also be associated to the environment because grid cell firing patterns are stable, say, from one day to the next. Path integration could not give you that. It has to be fixed to the environment somehow. And so there are many uh, sensory inputs, you know, like object vector cells or, or border cells or boundary vector cells that might be fixing the grid cells. But early on, we suggested that maybe the place cells and the grid cells, they're talking to each other, they project, they connect to each other because the place cells can help fix a grid cell to, to the environment. So if a place cell fires here, some kind of heavy learning would allow it to stabilize this grid cell by making this firing field always be here. And similarly, the grid cells can give this movement-related input to place cells so they can fire, say, when you switch off the light. And so together, overall, although when you look in detail, there's different place cells doing different things, probably the, the populations are doing a compromise between envi environmental and path integration uh, input. And uh, talking about these slow um, learning effects or effects that are things that change over time. So with the head direction signal, actually, if you have a head direction in a uh, cell in one box which fires, say, in this orientation, another box fires in this orientation, and you join the two with a corridor, uh, Talby is, the Talby, Talby's group has done this experiment, then eventually they end up having some coherent representation between both boxes. S sort of almost similarly, place cells in two perceptually similar environments, like I showed, will fire in the corresponding location driven by boundary vector cells initially. But slowly, over again, maybe the same sort of several days to a week, the firing will change so that they learn to distinguish the two environments and they do a slow remapping so that by the end of a week or so, different cells are firing in the two environments. 
And you can capture that with a BCM-like learning rule where the stronger firing field in one environment dominates and the connections that are uh, driving the weaker one um, get weaker, as long as there are some means of distinguishing the two boxes. And so we did this experiment, which um, Edvard mentioned slightly, and this is Caswell Barry and Francis Carpenter who did this, where rats explore in one box, and then they can walk in a corridor to another box. And we recorded uh, grid cells. And what you see is that early on, uh, the grid cells recapitulate between the two boxes. Probably, I would say, because they're being fixed to the environment by place cells, which are also recapitulating between the two boxes, which that experiment um, has been done by McNaughton in the, in the mid-90s, and has liked these boundary vector cell experiments. At least half of the cells fire in the same place in both boxes at the start. Uh, but the place cells slowly remap over time, as I told you, and the grid cells slowly change over time, so that by after, and this took uh, maybe you know, more than a week of experience, maybe up to two, 21 days was the longest that uh, Francis heroically recorded from, from cells. Uh, after weeks of experience, you end up with grid cells which look more like they're firing to a global grid, where the pattern is different in each box, so that it looks like it's beginning to align. And so it seems that with enough experience of walking between the two boxes, the path integration, if you like, can become consistent. And at the same time, the place cell representation has to shift so that now these two environments are recognized as different and you have different patterns of place cells firing in, in both environments. And that happens at the same rate as the grid cells changing. So it could be that this system is organized to combine self-motion and environmental inputs and uh, when you have some initial situation that's dominated by the uh, perceptual similarity of these two boxes, but you can walk between them enough times, you see a shift from the sort of perceptual dominance to the path integration dominance. And obviously it's path integration that tells you where you are in here relative to in here, because you can't see from this box. Yeah? You, you first and then you? Yeah. yeah. Just because he's got the microphone. <laughs> Just two, two questions. The first is, like, do you do you do any correlation al analysis on the common corridors or the ever seen cor corridor? Well, uh, yes. The, the the theme of being punished by raw data is coming back. I we like raw data. It, it, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it though. <laughs> uh, so it it turns out that well, there's only a tiny bit of raw data here actually. Um, it turns out that the um, as Edvard also mentioned, when you start running on a linear track, and this is not a linear track, but it's kind of a narrow corridor, uh, the grid cell firing becomes less regular, a little bit more broken up. And so uh, it, it was not really possible to correlate from the pattern here, although you can see some extensions. Actually, you can see this field, these fields are too close together, for example. So it wasn't, the, the pattern in the corridor didn't really match an extension of the pattern in either box. But that's probably because running backwards and forwards in a corridor just does change how grid cells fire. Uh, and so that screwed that up. We couldn't do that now. So another question would be, uh, I mean, I'm sure that you wanted to, to have simultaneous recordings from grid and place, right? Because in here you wanted to say, well, it's actually the place that are actually changed, which is dr driving now grid yeah, cells yeah. To, to remap. But another modeling perspective would be, well, actually, now the, the boundary or border cells encoding for the, you know, the separation wall between room A and room B are actually disappearing because they would be triggering, like, they would be receptive for a global environment, and now the animal is just perceiving, like, the two rooms to be connected, so there is no need for such border signal. So, I mean, from a modeling perspective... So, well, from an experimental from pers perspective, uh, Francis did record some simultaneous place cells with the grid cells. And they did show this slow remapping at the same sort of time as the, the grids were shifting. We didn't record any uh, border or boundary vector cells, so we can't say, but they're pretty perceptual. I would be surprised if they stopped firing just because some, somebody didn't need them. I mean, I think that's not... That wouldn't happen. Ah, oh, yes, he's coming... Do you think you would need to have these um, uh, the rats walking uh, in between the rooms, like if they would have been like teleported or like just translated uh, without walking between the rooms? I think the experience of this experiment is that they needed to walk between the rooms a lot 
it took you know it took two weeks or something to see to see a strong effect. So uh, if you were to make that weaker by making it less really apparent what the physical relation between the two boxes were, then it would be even longer. So you might be able to convince the rat of the or in the relative location of the two boxes in, in other ways, but just picking it up and putting it in the other box would not be enough, which is a bit like teleportation. Right? So, um, where were we now? Okay, so we can go back to our uh, model of uh, human memory. What, what would these grid cells uh, uh, give us, in potentially? So if we've got some uh, you know, motor inputs or, or movement-related inputs which are making these grid cells fire and, and can mediate the updating of our spatial location by our um, self-motion, you know, this could be another way into making the place cells fire for a given location. So I could, in principle, um, Imagine moving uh, north and making the place cells fire uh, over there. Now, it depends on your view of these connections, whether they're hardwired or not. And it may be that enough of them are hardwired that if I, and this is answering Paul's question from before, so he needs to stop doing his email. Uh, <laughs> it's OK, I'm only. <laughs> It could update the place cell representation to uh, make place cells fire in somewhere where maybe where you hadn't been before, because your grid cells can drive them to do that. If there's a hardwired connectivity between grid cells and place cells, it is possible. Uh, and then you could, um, you would still have problems activating the right cells here because you hadn't experienced the um, the location there. But if you, well, okay. So let's back off a, a minute. If, if you're uh, Imagining a familiar environment, then it's possible this grid cell input could help you to um, imagine movement within that environment, and you'd be able to imagine how the scene would change. And if you'd fully explored that environment so that you had uh, learned all the appropriate connections, that should all work smoothly, even in this simulation. And indeed, you can sim make that simulation, and it does work. The thing about novel environments is interesting, and uh, I still think that... Um, your parietal mechanisms for knowing how scenes will change as you move will be useful for generating, doing this interpolation. And we haven't tried to simulate that. But even, uh, you can see now that this would be useful in terms of memory retrieval. I might retrieve one place, I might want to change that place and retrieve something else. And as we get more general, you know, this could be, a place cell might not only represent place, it might just be a way of drawing out the relevant information for a particular concept, as we talked about concept cells before. And if these grid cells could shift which concept you want to uh, retrieve, then that would be a powerful thing. Anyway, we can start to test some uh, predictions of this model, given um, something that uh, Caswell Barry uh, noticed um, in this early experiment, which, is, which Edvard also uh, mentioned and did uh, also uh, see um, eventually. So if you record more uh, ventrally in entrinal cortex, the scale of the grids gets bigger. As, as was known in the original paper. But what Caswell noticed is that the scales seem to be quantized, so they increased in specific jumps as you go down. And uh, finally, Stensolo et al. produced a lot of data to verify that. But at the time, we noticed that. And what Caswell also noticed, which also uh, turns out to be uh, true, is that there's a tendency, even between different scale grid cells, to have uh, grids that are oriented in the same uh, direction. So the grids of neighboring grid cells tend to be the same scale and have the same orientation, but just be offset relative to each other. But even as you change the grid scale, uh, you maintain the orientation, the six axes of symmetry of the grid seem to be maintained. They're not perfectly ma maintained, and they're a little bit better maintained within a module than between modules, but they still seem to be uh, approximately aligned. And so if that's true, uh, we should be able to put people in a, in a brain scanner and have them do one of these uh, object location memory experiments. This is slightly different to the one I showed you, but in principle it's the same. Here is a circular environment with some distant views for orientation. There was a landmark in there as well, which we might come back to. And now your task is to find these little objects and remember where they are. And when you've picked one up, you know your memory will be tested by being shown the object. You have to go back to that location in the environment. So people can 
run a lot of trials uh, in the scanner playing this kind of video game with four or eight different objects to remember. And what you end up with is a, a path uh, that they make in the scanner. And now, because the orientations of the grids seem to align, what we might hope to see in the scanner is a change, uh, I'll come back to this, in the, in the metabolic activity that you detect in the scanner, according to whether you're running along these orange axes of the grid or these gray directions between each axis. And it's not that the total number of spikes will necessarily be different in these directions, but what we don't know is the coupling from neural firing to the, to the blood oxygenation level signal that we record, but we do know it's highly nonlinear. And so what we might hope is that as you're running along the grids, you're getting a small number of grid cells firing a lot as you go through all their fields. And other grid cells, you're missing all of their fields, so they're not firing at all. When you're running in between the directions, the principal axes of the grid, you get more cells firing less often. The total number of spikes may be the same, but the coupling to bold is highly nonlinear, so you might hope to see some difference according to running direction that varies every 60 degrees of running direction as you run aligned to the grid axes or misaligned to the grid axes. So if you look uh, in entorhinal cortex, uh, anatomically defined, you see this variation every 60 degrees of running direction while people are in the scanner. And if you do a whole brain analysis, you pull out, again, right entorhinal cortex and these other areas, medial parietal cortex, posterior parietal cortex, medial prefrontal, which are all tend to be active in autobiographical memory situations. You put somebody in the scanner and say, remember when you went to the dentist or remember your, your wedding. You see activity in these same areas. And so it may be that there is some link between grid-like activity during spatial memory tasks and more general ability to remember and imagine in this sort of episodic memory kind of way what happened to you in the past. And one hypothesis would be that it allows you to sort of imagine moving your viewpoint in imagery, which is, which is how you pull out information from your long-term memory. <coughs> you just took all the trials where the movement in the same direction and, and the concept of them with a random collection of other trials? So there's two, there's two analyses we did. One was uh, in entorhinal cortex, take half of the data and try and work out what the orientation of the grid would be. And then having found that orientation of the grid, make a regressor that goes up and down every 60 degrees with, with that orientation, apply it to the second half of the data. This analysis is a whole brain analysis um, where we did a, you do fMRI, fMRI adaptation. So we put in a regressor which said, uh, this is my current direction. How uh, long ago was I running at 60 degrees to this direction? And what it pulls out is uh, a reduction in signal whenever you're running in a similar direction to a recently run 60 degree different direction. And you can try that for, uh, and all of these analyses we checked with uh, 50 degrees, 45 degrees, 30 degrees, 75 degrees, 90 degrees to show that you didn't see the same effect that you see it's special to 60 degrees. So this is a whole brain fMRI adaptation analysis to how uh, recently did I run at 60 degrees. So you can apply it to the whole brain. Having to do. In here, uh, oh, I don't remember. So these are three by three by three millimeter voxels and entorhinal cortex is, is not that big. But I think it's something like, it's in the teens. It's something like 16, or something like that. Yeah, not that many. The offset, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, well, we think within any of these voxels, which are quite big, there'd be a lot of grid cells which would probably approximately uniformly cover the environment in terms of offset. But your point is a good one. There's lots of other, well, not lots. There's one other <laughs> way you can think of a 60 degree modulation by running direction, which would be if the head direction cells had their preferred directions. And there are lots, as Edvard said, there are a lot of head direction cells in the deep layers of entorhinal cortex. 
if they were clustered in their preferred directions every 60 degrees also, that could also give you this signal. All this signal shows you is there's something special about 60 degrees of running direction. Uh, but the only thing we know, and, and, and we have looked at head direction cells, you can't see that there are not many data sets with enough head direction cells to be sure. You can't see a strong clustering, but it could be there if it's weekly. But even so, 60 degrees and hexagonal grid-like patterns have some relationship. OK, um, you need to stop me right. Oh, well, I've nearly finished what I thought was the first brief bit, which we could then uh, apply in lots of different directions. But it's as well that I did it that way, because I think we're nearly approaching time, and we're nearly just reaching the end of that bit. So I said uh, th that the grid cells, they, their role might be in, in memory to uh, um, allow you to imagine moving your viewpoint or, or having a different imaginary viewpoint uh, from which to retrieve information. And so we did a uh, follow-up study where we had, uh, similarly to before, you uh, explore uh, a, a circular environment and you find some objects, you have to remember the object's location, uh, and then to test your memory, you're put back in the environment in a random location, you have to go back to where the object was. But before you do that, we ask people to imagine going back to where the object was. And then, after a, a certain period, they actually went back to where the object was. And so we could analyze the imagining moving in the environment in a particular direction, and the actually moving in the environment in a particular direction uh, in these subjects. And what you see is the same uh, six-fold uh, symmetry, the 60-degree signal, uh, during the imagined phase and during the actual movement phase. Uh, so you, you see a similar right enterinal uh, activity pattern that shows this six-fold symmetry for imagined movement as well as for actual movement. And um, we did s different. I think this analysis takes the grid orientation from the actual movement uh, period and applies it to the imagined movement period and shows you the, that you get this six-fold. So, as what I thought were going to be interim conclusions, and may well just be conclusions, um, because we know a lot about spatial representation, actual neural representations uh, in, in rodents, we can try and make a neural level uh, understanding of, of human spatial memory and imagination, which is, not, which is getting quite close to some aspects of episodic memory, given that the characteristic feature of episodic memory is supposed to be this ability to relive or re-experience, which I think uh, means uh, imagine. And um, equally, um, this episodic memory system has been associated with what is a been called since uh, 2007 episodic future thinking, which um, I see as imagery, where you can imagine what might happen next or what might happen in the future. And I think we're pretty close to understanding how that uh, might happen at the level of neurons. And then there's the interesting question about um, beyond space. So space I see as being a, a fantastically useful paradigm for finding out what these neurons are doing and exploring rodents. Uh, and when we understand the representations and, and, and computations there, it should help us to understand other uh, domains which are harder to get at. And there was, this was a very interesting paper by Tim Behrens' group last year, where they had people uh, trained to uh, sort of detect different bird uh, silhouettes. Uh, and all the silhouettes vary just in terms of the neck length and the leg length. So there's actually a hidden two-dimensional space there of neck length and leg length. And they learned to shift this uh, bird silhouette uh, between different forms of bird, which were associated with different rewards. And they did that in the scanner and did the same analysis that we had done. And you see, again, this grid-like representation, particularly in this medial prefrontal area, but also in enterinal cortex, for navigation in this uh, abstract space of learned associations of neck and leg length uh, of, of bird silhouettes. And so it's possible that this whole mechanism can be seen as a way of um, extracting allocentric or abstract associative uh, information so that you can generate, uh, you can pull out the right part of conceptual space and imagine it in your uh, explicit memory or, or um, conscious awareness. Anyway, I should thank lots of people.
Uh, Andrzej Bikanski did these most recent simulations. Uh, Sue Becker did the original ones. Um, Caswell Barry did much of the experimental work that I mentioned in collaboration uh, with Kate Jeffrey or John O'Keefe. The virtual reality stuff often involved John King. And the modeling often involved Tom Hartley. Tom Lever recorded a lot of neurons. Christian Dola did the most recent imaging that I mentioned, except for the very most recent bit, which was done by Aidan Horner. Thank you very much. And here are all the things that we didn't talk about. Which is what? <laughs> okay, well, we talked about those things. All right, questions for me. Who has the microphone? Here's the microphone. Okay. Then we'll um, so, um, this, this uh, macroscopic uh, grid signal has been uh, related to uh, Alzheimer's, oh, yeah. even disease, no? for like young people at risk of Alzheimer's. Um, do you think it is. Um, and, and also, I'm, I'm curious about this, the, the fact that you find it like whole, in, in like whole brain, all over the brain. But we don't really know if this is a grid-like or really a, 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 grid, uh, a grid pattern that is uh, at the single unit level also there. So do you think this is... Uh, so how does the grid pattern itself relate to this lack of uh, this, uh, this risk? Oh, um, in, in Alzheimer's, yeah. uh, or in memory, in well, so this it's, it's related. So, so uh, we did one analysis um, in that experiment where, if you look at the consistency of grid orientation extracted from each voxel of the 15 or 16 or whatever in each participant, the ones that have the more consistent grid orientation had better spatial memory. So that's some correlation with performance. And then this interesting um, study which Christian Dola did uh, when he became a, a PI in the Donda Center um, in, in young people at risk of Alzheimer's, yes, it showed a degraded um, grid-like signal, even though their spatial memory performance was not degraded. Uh, although it, their behavior was slightly different. They, they did stick near the edges of the um, environment a bit more than the, the health of the non-risk group. Um, but yeah, so this is a macroscopic measure. It shows some 60 degree modulation. It could be caused by uh, head direction cells clustered at 60 degrees or, or populations of grid cells. Uh, we don't exactly know the relationship, but um, it's interesting that knowledge seems to be organized with this hexagonal structure. Uh. Thank you for your talk. Um, well, so when I kind of like break this down to myself, so I can explain it to myself, um, I think about memory and how um, I'm remembering things. And I think that memory, for me at least, happens in the form of how things relate to one another in space. And so, have you done a task in which the participants are given more than one object, in which they have object one, and they have to relocate it, and then they have object two, and they have to relocate it, and then they're given object one again. Have you done something? Yes, yeah, so in these experiments, actually, typically there were four or even eight objects that they went around picking up and learning where they were, and then they were tested in random orders. You know, here's the basketball, go to where the basketball was, here's the... Would you account that as being more egocentric or allocentric reference? Uh, well, um, the task was explicitly go to the place in the world where you found this object before, and we put them in a starting position which was uh, not the, where they had been when they found it the first time. So we biased it to use an allocentric strategy. They needed to know where it was in the world. You could run a task where they always turn left and find the object, and then they would probably remember to turn left and find the object, which would be an egocentric strategy and would probably be learned more or yeah, be learned more in the, stri in the striatum as it happens, where you see more of a procedural learning mechanism. Uh, yeah, um, great, uh, great uh, talk. I had a bit of a concern about parietal cortex with species difference, primates and humans versus rats. For instance, Doug Nitz has recorded these egocentric turn uh, motor cells and I wondered how you 
can incorporate it in relation to imagery? And uh, well, um, yeah, probably, uh, well, certainly the um, primate parietal cortex has a lot more cells that are interested in visual location than the rat. Uh, there will be some, but their visual system works a bit differently. Uh, and so um, there are other parts of parietal lobe which are more concerned with movement. You know, the parietal lobes between sort of sent visual input and motor areas for a reason. It does this integration between the two. And uh, I would think Doug Nitz's trajectory uh, responses, you know, left, left, right kind mm -hmm. of thing, are more related to the primate stuff, which is more to do with motor function, so reaching in different directions and so on. If you let the monkeys run around, they will probably, you'll probably see some cells like Doug Nitz's cells there. Mm. Uh, and so that doesn't really relate to visual imagery, but we could go back to the previous, the talks yesterday and say, well, you know, maybe you've got a similar thing for motor imagery and mirror cells, and, you know, maybe it would all work the same way. I haven't simulated it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I think as with inter individual differences, species differences, there would be much more representation of visual inputs in primates and much more representation of olfactory and you know, the, the movement representation sort of present in both you know, rodents and primates. And so there's different weightings of the importance of the different representations, but probably the mechanism how they work will have some commonalities because you have a fundamental issue of this egocentric, allocentric translation and you have to end up getting to the right place and so there could be some Uh, in the experiment where they had to, the, the, the subjects had to put the, the, the mark again where they found the object, did they have a, a time limitation? So did you say, okay, you have to do this in three seconds or in ten seconds? In that, I that think spread? they had uh, ten or fifteen seconds to do it in, but they nobody hit the time limit. So they, they, they had as much time as they wanted, essentially. Yeah. Okay, so they, have, they had all the time they wanted to do all the calculations. They needed. Yeah, but they typically... So it's not clear that you're consciously uh, aware of all of these different strategies. And, and so if you ask people, they say, yeah, I felt it was there, you know. And you try and say, were you looking at, you know, the visual scene? Did you sense how far the way walls, wall, walls were? And they're kind of, yeah, I just thought it was there, you know. So it's hard, yeah. Presumably these things are happening in parallel, but what actually consciousness makes of it in retrospect after you've done it is another complicated thing. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, uh, I mean, because uh, as you mean that, you know, there are different types of neurons and, uh, and you were talking about the weights, but some, you know, it, it, will, it might be different the weights for, for different people. So if you give them a very short time constraint, okay, this they might go to the... This is a good point. So th th there's experiments, so... Um, now, my favorite tactic. Um, yes, there are people have done experiments um, looking more at this distinction between uh, procedural movement related uh, stuff and explicit sort of imagery. Yes, here's a, this is a nice experiment done by uh, Packard and McGaw. Uh, so here, early on, so you, you train a rat to uh, start up here and it's rewarded here. And so after several trials it to get the hang of it. Uh, but occasionally they gave probe trials from the opposite direction. And early on in training, the animal would go here. And later on, after eight or eight or nine correct responses, it would start to make the body turn this one. Go over here when, it, when you do this probe trial. They're not rewarded on the probe trials. It's just, where would you, where would you go? And so what they, and what they did was they showed that if you inactivate the stratum, uh, you don't see development of this response strategy. Whereas if you inactivate the hippocampus, you impair the uh, original learning. This is presumably to the place within the experimental room. And so you see that, that difference. Um, now, remind me what your question was. Uh, yeah, if, if you push... Uh, the yes, the weight. So it's yes. Okay, so um, you do... Um, we, we did something similar in, in uh, an experiment uh, where we um, had a landmark within the uh, environment, and the object, you had to remember an object. If it's near the landmark, you might well remember where it was relative to the landmark. 
if it was near the boundary, you'd probably remember where it was relative to the boundary. Occasionally, you move one relative to the other. You see the same thing, that if you make your response sort of relative to the landmark, you see more activity in the stratum, and relative to the boundary, more activity in the hippocampus. Um, and so you see that this difference in weighting is, is you know, uh, between the, the stratum can tell you where to go and the hippocampus can tell you where to go. And in that uh, packard and McGraw experiment, it varies over time. It becomes automatic, you start using your stratum. Maybe it's less effortful, less consciously aware, whatever, you can do it more easily. Um, but actually, if you um, now put time pressure, which was actually your question, uh, there are experiments like uh, in fire evacuation where you have um, an environment and you, you know where the door is, right? And if I ask you to imagine where the door is, you can imagine where the door is. But um, if there's a fire and you have to go quickly, you tend to retrace your route rather than taking a shortcut. So you probably use this straightle or more low level, uh, you know, I know I just went like this, I'll go back on myself because it maybe takes longer to engage all this imagery and stuff. And so the, the weights can also depend on, on the situation. And um, also, if it's a, a horrible scene, if it's a traumatic situation, it seems as a down regulation. Maybe the sort of stress that you get if it's a fire evacuation or, or if you're looking at a horrible scene seems to down regulate the hippocampal system and you get more uh, visceral responses, maybe via the amygdala to the actual sensory qualities of the item rather than the where it is in the world and all this kind of stuff. Other questions for Neil? Did you ever try uh, things like uh, putting, uh, let's say, a hexagonal or non-hexagonal patterning, like visual patterning on the surface to try to disrupt or manipulate the, the grids? Uh, n well, um, in, in these virtual, uh, we have had some virtual experiments, yeah, where uh, you, you're looking for textures for the virtual reality floor, and hexagonal patterns quite often come up. It doesn't make a, it doesn't make any difference to the grid cell firing whether there's a hexagonal or non-hexagonal pattern on the, on the floor. Right? We have done that experiment. Incidentally, we didn't do the experiment for that reason, but that is true. Uh, there are some experiments which. Uh, have not been published yet, and there's one that was published which seemed to indicate that there might be hexagonal patterns in terms of eye movement direction. I don't know what to make of these at the moment, but um, it may be that um, you get a hexagonal organization, not just a sort of semantic knowledge in this bird space, but also maybe of, of the scene when you're trying to uh, you know, work out which saccades you should make next. But I think we need to see the details of those experiments. Uh, you didn't get part of your talk about theta, and uh, I was wondering, sort of, if you could roughly <laughs> summarise what you wanted to say about that, and also what you think of this recent proposal from John Lisman about the two sort of uh, early and late phases of theta uh, having different functional roles. Uh, well, yes, I can, I, I can tell you about both of those, but, um, so, theta phase precession is, it, so if, you're, if your rat is running along a, a, a linear track or, or running around in general, you can see a nice strong theta rhythm around 8 hertz in the local field potential. You see something similar but more transient uh, in humans doing virtual navigation if you're recording from epilepsy patients. And so what John O'Keefe noticed uh, early in the 90s is that as the uh, rat runs through the firing field of the place cell, you get this change in the preferred phase of firing from um, later in the cycles, the theta cycle, to earlier in the theta cycle. And this uh, is known as phase precession. Bill Skaggs called it phase precession. So if you plot firing phase versus distance traveled, you get this relationship. And uh, so uh, John Lisman, although uh, building on work from uh, Misha Sodix and various other people uh, in the, in the mid-90s, um, suggested that maybe the end of the field here, end of the firing field, is where the sort of sensory input makes the place cell fire. And this firing that you get earlier along the track, but actually later in time, um, because this phase is shifting from late to early, within each sleep cycle is um, 
is this cell beginning to fire, not because it gets sensory input, which comes here on the track, but firing early on the track because it's getting input from other cells that are firing earlier on the track. And that they may have learned, say, by some uh, spike time-dependent plasticity or something, associative connections from themselves when they fire here to cells that fire uh, later on the track. And so you get unidirectional connections from these earlier cells, these later cells. And so that explains why it's a bit later in the theta cycle that you get the firing of this cell now here, because that information has come from the environment via the duller phase cells, and they're making it fire earlier on the track. And uh, there's some interesting ideas about phase cells indicating the expectancy that they're going to, that the rat is going to occupy their preferred place a little bit before they do. It could be useful for computational reasons, prediction error, and so on. Uh, Technically, in reinforcement learning, it could be a successor representation, which would help you to evaluate future expected reward. Uh, and so those are all interesting ideas. And then uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure what Lisman's latest development is, but uh, it's a difference between this being the sort of sensory input and this being the recall phase. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I think um, uh, Mike Hasselmoe made that suggestion in 1996. Uh, based on the timing and the fact that you know maybe recurrent connectivity in, in, uh, in CA3 would be the recall and that would be a bit later than the feed forward input. But yeah, there's a lot of ideas like that around and that, that they're interesting things to follow up. Uh, well, there's a separate thing which is, um, does this help you do path integration? And um, that's a completely separate thing which does not, is not built in it's not quite clear how these two things relate to each other, but uh, if you look at this overall pattern, and this pattern is present on the first run in the environment, in a new environment, so I don't think it necessarily has to be uh, anything to do with learning and retrieval versus new encoding. Um, and if you block NMDA receptors, uh, you still see this pattern, so I'm not sure it's the learned association between place cells that actually gives you this space effect. Uh, However, there's a lot of good ideas there which may well be right for other reasons. And uh, good luck to them. Well, I think uh, but, but the thing about path integration is that actually this uh, correlation here means that you can use the change in phase to tell you how far you've gone. And that might be useful for the mechanism that lets the grid cells integrate movement. No, but John also, John Listman um, used it to make the point that the hippocampus may be more involved with, with mental time travel. Than with, let's say, storing memories. So, uh, that's a bit of shift now in, the, in that story. There's lots of sequential stuff that's very interesting. For example, the consequence of phase precession in a given cell is that if you look at the population, the encoded locator will move from behind the animal to in front of the animal, just because at the early phases, they're the uh, cells firing early phase uh, uh, when the rat's here and the, and the field mostly firing is behind it. Whereas at the late phase, um, it's firing in front of it because it's just from late to early. And so if you just think of the consequence of this happening in the whole population of cells, you get this forward sweep within each cycle where you get activity of the, current, the locations behind you sweeping through to the locations in front of you every theta cycle, just as a consequence of this. You get that sweep. And that could be very useful for many reasons, path planning, all sorts of things. And yes, it could relate to sequential memory, memory for sequences. And I'm not saying that you don't get associative connections, unidirectional connections in this direction of travel. You probably do. And they could be very useful for sequential memory. But most of our experiments are actually in open fields where you run through the field in lots of different directions. And so you wouldn't be able to build up asymmetric chains of connectivity in any one direction because you run through equally often in the opposite direction. But you still always see phase procession where it goes from um, late to early as you run through this way or this way. So it still tells you how far, what distance you've travelled, but um, it might not be direction dependent. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks for the questions.